welcome friends and family of um, Ned, what we call him brother Ned here, or mate. <laughs> <laughs> so it's nice to see everyone here to remember him. So we'll just start off with a, a prayer. Dear Father, Jehovah God in the heavens, we come before you now. We um, pray, Jehovah, that your spirit will be among us uh, this afternoon. We do know that um, it is a sad occasion for uh, all of us, um, but we do um, like to do our best to remember Brother Ned, um, remember his uh, big smile and his um, funny little stories that he always had. So we do pray, Jehovah, that you'll be able to um, help us too uh, through all our trials that we do face. We look forward to the time when um, there will be no more death. It is a beautiful promise that you have in the Bible. Uh, we do pray that this um, will come very soon uh, worldwide, Jehovah. So we do um, like to reflect on Brother Ned for a, a while, and we pray that you'd be able to help Brother Mel too with his talk as well. So we like to pray for all these things through your son Christ Jesus' name. Just before we start, just a, a little reminder. Um, if we haven't filled out the registry at the at the back, maybe just after the program's finished, we can make sure that that's been done. And also just our devices too, if they're on a silent setting. So we'd like to hand over to Brother Mel Woods. Welcome along everybody today. As you probably saw on your program, a celebration and thanksgiving for the life of Edward Basil Bashetti, but as Brother Grant said, we knew him as Ned, most people probably knew him as Ned, we called him Brother Ned, which is really nice. I've got a life story that Brother Ned actually had recorded a couple of years ago. I'm going to read just a portion of that out of it so that some of us that have only known him for a bit of time will get a bit of background information, a bit of knowledge about. Ned and his upbringing. This is his experience. He says, my father came out to Australia when I was one year old. Dad came from northern Italy. Mum was Irish and she was born in Australia. They settled in the town of Shepparton. Dad was a sheep shearer. Dad was not home much. He was away working on big stations in New South Wales and South Australia for months at a time. Mum was home alone raising the children. I had an older brother and younger sister. It's lovely to see that they're able to come along today. Really sad in the first few years, he said, Mum died when I was three. My younger sister was one year old and my older brother was four. Dad came home for a short period and organised a deserted wife who also had a daughter to care for my siblings and I while Dad was working away. Two years later, when I was at the age of five, my dad died with cancer. I remember our carer talking to us in the hallway at home and she said, Your father is not coming home, he has died. I'd only just started school when he died. So, really sad start to life, isn't it? We were both parents by the age of five. Fortunately, the female carer looked after them well. He said, I started calling the female carer mum, and her name was Eva Burns. She treated the children very well and cared for us three plus her own. We had four children. When I was 12, we moved to Bainton, Victoria, with Eva and the family. And interestingly, he says, at 14, I left home and moved to Woodhead, 27 miles away. I started working with the PMJ, or the Postmaster General, that was known then, now known as Australia Post, as a telegram boy. We continued there until the age of 26 and left the job for a while. Then I returned at the age of 28 until I retired at 60 years old. So we take that two steps, 12 years to begin with, and then 32 years later on, he spent 44 years in total working for Australia Post. You don't see too many people today that work 44 years in the one profession. Until retirement at age 60. He tells now a little bit about his early dealings with Jehovah's Witnesses. He says, at the age of 16, I started studying the Bible with Jehovah's Witnesses. They lived in Kyneton, nine miles from Woodhead, so I would ride my push bike the nine miles to their house. I would travel along the main highway, up and down the big hills that led to the home. I studied the book, Let God Be Found True, and went to some meetings for 12 months occasionally. I studied every second week during that time. He says, though, I was convinced that this was the truth. However, at 17, I drifted away for a couple of years, 
because of a variety of reasons. I got involved with motorcycles and loved it very much. I loved it, stayed with me right through my life. At 18, I bought a Triumph 500 motorcycle and then a Triumph 650 motorcycle. He then says, when I was 19, I moved to Shepparton in 1960. And some of the older ones here might remember some of these names. I met a brother named Bob McFadgen about 12 months later and he organised for me to start studying with Robert Watson two weeks later. I also attended the meetings regularly. The Blue Book was studied, I grasped the truth and got baptised the 17th of August 1963 at age 22. He says, sadly, five or six years after that I drifted out of the truth. It was due to a variety of reasons and I felt sorrow. He says, due, due to these sad feelings, I decided to leave Shepparton and, and start somewhere else. I'm about to declare to never return to Shepparton again. I moved out of Shepparton and moved to Newcastle. I got involved with motorcycles again and the Senior Motorcycle Club. I lived in Newcastle for 33 years. Then he says, interestingly, just before leaving Newcastle, I was contacted again in the Territory and accepted the Watchtower and WAC magazines, but I didn't let the brothers know that I was one of Jehovah's Witnesses. After leaving Newcastle for some time, I travelled extensively around Australia with probably all the dirty stories of these four-wheel expeditions out in the outback. And we've got some nice pictures out the back of some of his journeys as well. And he loved doing that. He loved relating his love of four-wheel driving. I moved to Jerilbury at the age of 62. Ten years later, the witnesses made contact with me again. So this is at the age of 72. He says, after 44 years away from the truth. A sister by the name of Shirley Bain was doing door-to-door -door work, offering the Watchtower and Awake magazines. A couple of calls were made, and after the sixth call, she gave an invitation to the memorial, and I said to myself, I am going to go to that memorial. The next time Sister Shirley called, she was reading the Bible to me. And so I went and got my Bible, showed her a date on the inside cover, which, which reads 17th of August, 1963. I said to her, that's the day I was baptised as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. It was a very emotional time for me. I wanted to return to Jehovah. He says, the arrangements were made to attend the memorial in 2014. The best decision I've ever made. I was welcomed back to the congregation and Jehovah with loving, open arms. And then we know the next spent the last seven years of his life as a loved and valued member of the Cobham congregation. Firstly in Jerubra, where he set such a fine example in traversing the highway back and forth on a really regular basis, never missing a meeting, setting a really fine example for us. And then, the last five years, obviously, he moved as close as he could to the Kingdom Hall, just down the road. Uh, it was really easy, it was lovely, but he was able to have people drop in all the time. He also writes this, which I thought was really interesting. He says, since returning, I have suffered the challenge of diabetes, also had gangrene in my foot as a result of the illness. This resulted in having half of my foot surgically removed. If I was not one of Jehovah's Witnesses, I wouldn't have had a reason to keep on living. However, because I am one of Jehovah's Witnesses, this gave me a reason to get out of hospital so I could get back to the meetings and serve Jehovah. And he certainly did a wonderful job of that after his initial illness. So we'll go back and have a look at a little bit of the things he wrote, the conclusion of that a little bit later. But now we come to the actual funeral discourse because it is a sad occasion being here, isn't it? We look around this afternoon, we see grief, we see sadness, and we know that this is the normal reaction at the death of a loved one. And I know that Brother Ned's death really has affected young and old alike. Many of us might have only known Ned for seven years, but we've got to know him fairly well in that period of time because of the closeness within the congregation, and, and we are hurting, aren't we, because we've lost somebody really special to us. But it's natural to be grieving, it's natural to be hurt. The Bible actually contains many accounts where grief and mourning are displayed when ones died. For instance, when Jesus' friend Lazarus died, he was emotionally affected. If you open your Bible, if you've got one, to the book of John, we're actually going to display the scriptures up on the board, but John chapter 11, verses 33 to 35, we'll see here Jesus actually talking to Lazarus' sister Mary, it just shows the effect that Lazarus' death had on Jesus. So John chapter 11, verses 33 to 35. When Jesus saw her weeping, this is Mary, and the Jews who had come with her weeping, he groaned within himself and he became troubled. He said, where have you laid him? 
They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus gave way to tears. So this perfect man was actually emotionally affected to the degree that he was groaning, he gave way to tears. And yet, interestingly, Jesus actually knew that he would resurrect Lazarus, but still the grief so evident in those around him moved him really deeply. But it's lovely to know that Jesus has feelings like that. Well, his father, Jehovah God, displays similar emotions. He has tender feelings for ones who need comfort and grief from the loss of a loved one. We have a beautiful scripture in Psalm 34 and verse 18 that really highlights for us the care and compassion that Jehovah has. Psalm 34 and verse 18. Psalm 34, verse 18. Jehovah is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. So we may feel emotionally affected. We, we may be grieving, but Jehovah God can be really close to us and give us assistance and aid. So in sad times, we all long for hope and reassurance, don't we? We, we want that hope, that reassurance. Where can we find it? Well, the Bible, God's own word, gives us absolute assurances of hope for the future. It gives a wonderful hope also for those that have died. When we read through the Bible, we learn of Jehovah God's qualities. It is the God of wisdom, justice, love and power. We also read that old age, sickness and death were not part of his original plan for mankind. And we see by the sadness when someone dies that, that death is not natural. No one wants death. Why did it come about? Well, death is directly the result of the first man, Adam's disobedience. Jehovah created Adam with wonderful prospects ahead of him. The opportunity to live, not just to live and enjoy, but to live and enjoy life forever in beautiful conditions on earth. Now that really is a wonderful prospect, isn't it? But unfortunately, it was, con was conditional on obedience. And unfortunately, Adam and Eve didn't show that obedience. And we can read why we're in the condition we're in. If you go back to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 2, and verses 15 to 17, Jehovah just gave a command for Adam to follow. If he hadn't followed, he would have had the opportunity to continue living. Finally says what he needed to do. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. says, Jehovah took the man and settled him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and to take care of it. Jehovah God also gave this command to the man. From every tree of the garden you may eat to satisfaction, but as for the tree of knowledge of good and bad, you must not eat from it. From the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. So it was dependent on his obedience to Jehovah God's command. Sadly, we know that Adam and Eve didn't obey. They went their own way. Satan despises that serpent, enticed them to partake of that fruit, and the consequence has been really far-reaching. What's been the result of that disobedience? Well, it's affecting each one of us today. Let's turn our Bibles to Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. That tells us the sad reality that there is at present. That's Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. The Bible tells us why we die. Romans 5 12 says, That is why just as through one man, or Adam, that sin that he performed, entered into the world, and death spread through sin, and so death spread to all men because they had all sinned. So the reality is, we grow old, we suffer sickness, and we die because of the disobedience of Adam in the first place. But as we said, death's not natural, and the grief and the hurt it causes, we feel that today. But fortunately, the God who created mankind is also fully aware of that, fully aware that we're suffering, that we, we feel grief, we feel sorrow. And Jehovah God, as I said, one of his qualities, and his main attribute is he is a God of love. And so he has made provision for a wonderful hope for the future. 
and he's hooked and tied in here, in his word, the Bible. There's a beautiful scripture for us to read in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 10 and 11, that really gives us wonderful assurance of why we can trust the promises contained in God's inspired word, the Bible. That's Isaiah chapter 55, and verses 10 and 11. This is Jehovah himself speaking. He says, For well, just as the rain and the snow pour down from heaven, and do not return there until they saturate the earth, making it produce and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. We know that happens when the rain comes, it saturates the ground, everything sprouts, it's really good results. Notice what he says in verse 11 about his word. He says, So my word that goes out from my mouth will be. It will not return to me without results but it will certainly accomplish whatever is my delight, and it will have sure success in what I send it to do. Do you notice some of the key thoughts in, in those verses there? He says it will be, it will not return without results. It will certainly accomplish, and it will have sure success. Nowhere do we read this might happen, or maybe this will come about. We can have absolute certainty that what God has written in his word will come true. And one of the scriptures that we really look to was on our program today. You might have noticed our theme scripture there, Revelation 21, verses 3 and 4. And this is Jehovah's words recorded for us. And this is again Jehovah himself speaking. So Revelation 21, 3 and 4, we're going to look at verse 4 on the screen, but first we'll read verse 3 and 4. Just notice the reassurance in these words, the contrast to what we see today. Jehovah says, With battle I heard a loud voice from the throne table, The tent of God is with mankind, and he will reside with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them. And he will wipe out every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more. I will mourn and will outcry and will pain me and will the former things have passed away. Direct promise from Jehovah God that he will wipe out the tears, the sorrow, the grief, the mourning, and there will be a time when death will be no more. We will be back to the original purpose that he had for mankind on earth. Don't we look forward to that time? But what about now? What are the future prospects and condition of Brother Ned and others who pass away because of that? inherited sin from Adam. Well, the Bible clearly explains for us the condition of the dead. Because there are lots of thoughts in many of the churches around the world about what happens at death and the body goes to different places. Let's have a look at Psalm 146 and verse 4. Psalm 146 verse 4. His spirit or his life force goes out he returns to the ground on that very day his thoughts perish. So his thoughts perish. That really harmonises with the clear direction or instruction of Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5 which says, the living know that they will die, but as for the dead, they're conscious of nothing at all. So we don't float off into some other realm awaiting the results or whatever it might be. The Bible says at that time when we die, we go back to the ground, our thoughts perish. So, is death the end for Brother Ned and others who die? Well, fortunately, we have God's word and the assurances that we said that are certain to come true. And the Bible gives us an absolute assurance that millions who have died will live again by means of the resurrection of the dead. And that resurrection, that resurrection hope, is made possible by the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made when he came to earth. In fact, let's have a look at what Jesus himself says about his purpose for coming to earth. That's in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28. A lot of people maybe aren't aware so much of this fact. They know he came to earth and taught people. In Matthew 20 and verse 28, Jesus says, just as the Son of Man came, not to be ministered to, but to minister, so we're certainly to talk and to teach and to preach, but then, and to give his life as a ransom in exchange for many. 
So Jesus would willingly give of his life for the opportunity for us, millions of others to actually be resurrected. Any proof of that? Well, Jesus himself was resurrected and his resurrection provides a guarantee for the future that his own words recorded in John chapter 5 will certainly come true. Reinforces the surety of that promise. Let's have a look at John chapter 5 verses 28 and 29 on the board. And I read verse 25 as well. So John chapter 25, this is Jesus himself speaking. Notice what he says. He says, Most truly I say to you, the hour is coming, and it is now, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who have paid attention will live. And it's Jesus himself speaking. Those that have paid attention, the dead, they will actually live. And then verses 28 and 29, the surety of the promise, he says, do not be amazed at this, for the hour is coming in which all those in the memorial tomb will hear his voice and come out. Those who do good things to a resurrection of life, those who practice vile things to a resurrection of judgment. But notice there, don't be amazed, it's going to happen. Jesus makes that absolute promise that those in the memorial tombs will come out and be resurrected. Well, Brother Ned was certainly aware of these promises, the promises that Jehovah God made. And he often excitedly spoke about how much he was looking forward to the realisation of Jehovah's original purpose for the earth being fulfilled. And the opportunity to be there in perfect health. He often spoke about having half a foot and how would be back to have, to have his whole foot back and be able to walk around. He was really looking forward to coming back and enjoying fitness and health. We know that time will definitely come. What about us today? Us who are here today, it's nice to see you all here. We know we have quite a number that will be streaming in because of circumstances with COVID and age and other things. Be watching via stream and what a wonderful arrangement that is as well. How can we benefit by being here? What, what aid can we get from being here? Well, the reality is that a funeral reminds us of the brevity and the uncertainty of life. I know sometimes I look in the mirror and just wonder where did all of those years go. I'm sure many feel the same way. All of a sudden, years have disappeared on us, haven't they? How quickly time passes us by. And death makes us think about how we're using our life. Where are we now? What, what are we achieving? What are we actually doing? Interestingly, Psalm 90 verse 12 tells us what we can analyse. Psalm 90 verse 12. Nice thought here, addressed to Jehovah, but notice what the psalmist said. Psalm 94, teach us how to count our days so that we may acquire a heart of wisdom. So think about the time we are. Think about the time we've got left, what we can do, how we can use our time. And we know those of us within the Cobham congregation really appreciate that Brother Ned set such a fine example in being wise in the choices he made. His, his meeting attendance is exemplary for somebody of his age and circumstances. Participation in the ministry work. When we were cleaning or looking at his flat the other day, right up until the time he left, he's got letters that he was writing that are on his desk that he was sending out to people to try and help them learn about Jehovah. We'll certainly miss his unique style of answering at the meetings. You could say it was direct and blunt at times. He had his own lingo, his own slang to a certain degree. But he had a love for Jehovah and the way he expressed himself. We really enjoyed that, didn't we? The scriptures assure us that we can make a good name with Jehovah by the way we live. By zealous works and godly conduct, we share in sanctifying Jehovah's name. And we know that Brother Ned remains steadfast in his obedience to Jehovah's standards. He had a really strong determination not to undertake any treatment that would be questionable in any way. He was really resolved in that fact. He wanted to be obedient to Jehovah. Just a little bit in his story. After his first stint in hospital, he wrote of some of the blessings. He said, while I was away from Jehovah, I always felt I had no real purpose. Now that I've returned to Jehovah, I feel content and satisfied. I feel like I have a real purpose in life, have a reason to live. I also feel like I have a real hope for the future. So that's that future that is still to come. So the resurrection hope that we spoke of earlier was certainly an incentive for Brother Ned. 
It's how it should be for all of us to learn and do Jehovah's will. Those who learn about Jehovah and his beautiful promises for the future can be certain that they will soon see their resurrected dead ones again. So rather than mourn too deeply today, what we should be doing is thinking about those wonderful promises. Be thankful that Ned's suffering is over and the pain that he was being put through and enduring is actually finished. We can use our gathering today and the days ahead to comfort and support each other. In fact, there's a beautiful scripture in 1 Thessalonians 5.11. What well, as congregations of Jehovah's people and, and brothers and sisters and friends, what we can actually do. 1 Thessalonians 5.11. says, therefore, keep encouraging one another and building one another up, just as you are, in fact, doing. And we see that, don't we? That we can offer encouragement, strength and hope to one another. I'll just read another portion of what Brother Ned wrote. He said, Jehovah has supported me through my trials, and I don't feel alone. I had so many visits from my brothers while being unwell. And I realise that the truth is incomparable with anything else. I appreciate it so much. I also feel glad that I have the confidence to speak to Jehovah again in prayer. So how can we be encouraging and build one another up? Just as Brother Ned recognised that to be the case. But we can remind each other of the Bible's sure hope for the future and provide emotional support. And as Ned said in those thoughts, he was supported. He didn't feel alone. The visits really encouraged him. When we read through his will, he didn't have a lot in his will. It was a very um, brief will. But he said that he wanted flowers at his funeral. And so wasn't it lovely of the congregation, the sisters here, to actually have some beautiful flowers. We know Ned, some of us might have known the soft touch that he had in that regard, but he, that he wanted flowers at the funeral. But the congregation really pulled together and made it so that it can be a really nice occasion today. So Ned appreciated the congregation, the support of the congregation. And these five words at Proverbs 17, verse 17, are directed to each one of us. Proverbs 17 and verse 17. And again, just the care that we can show for one another. Proverbs 17, 17. A true friend shows love at all times and is a brother who is willing for times of distress. So it might be a distressing time at the moment, but we can, with love, show that love to one another, that care, that compassion for one another. Jehovah wants us to do that to each other. We also need to show that love in, to others in distressing times. Interestingly, I'm going to read you the last few words of Brother Ned's experience. This is what he wrote at the conclusion. And many of us might feel this way to a degree as well. He said, I would like to be fit enough to do more for Jehovah, however my health limits me. It is wise to serve Jehovah when you are young in the days of your young manhood. And I should have followed this advice myself. I'm sorry I didn't. Jehovah is a wonderful and loving God who shows forgiveness. He has allowed me to come back and associate with his people. He is the creator and he does magnificent things. Aren't they really beautiful and heartfelt words? So for us, we prayerfully look to Jehovah as the one who can give us strength. And we need that strength until he will provide that permanent relief that we've actually spoken about. But in the meantime, let's read our final scripture in Psalm 9, verses 9 and 10. What we can all be doing, where we can put our reliance and our trust. Psalm 9, 9 and 10. It says, Jehovah will become a secure refuge for the oppressed, a secure refuge in times of distress. Those knowing your name will trust in you. You will, never, you, will, you will never abandon those seeking you, O Jehovah. So Jehovah will become that refuge. So Jehovah is and will continue to be a secure refuge for those who put their trust in him. 
And so many of us are able to gain comfort and hope, securing the knowledge that Brother Ned now is safe in Jehovah's memory. So, on behalf of the Bishetti family and the Cobham congregation, we thank you all for your attendance, for your love and your support today. And afterward, we can certainly reminisce a little bit and, and find out a little bit more. That'd be really nice. So what we're going to do now is conclude with a beautiful song of hope. We're actually not allowed to sing according to governmental regulations. But song number 151 that's in your program, and we'll actually have the Rock Tower chorus. Cool. Chorus, not the chorus. Watch Tower Choir will actually sing a song for us. Song 151. He will call on after the song brother Shane and Shay will conclude our meeting in prayer as well. So Song 151, thanks Josh.
we approach you now on this sad occasion. So firstly, thank you for the privilege we've all had of knowing Ned. We are truly grateful that we got to share this life with him. And we are truly going to miss him, Jay. Even though we are going to miss him, Father, we are grateful that he isn't suffering anymore and he's in your memory, Jay. And therefore we know that he has this wonderful opportunity to meet us again in the new system where he will be perfect, and we can welcome him with open arms to him. So while we are missing Ned, we pray that your spirit be with us. Please comfort us in our time of need. Please help us to remember all the good things that we, we have with Ned, and that we can keep his memory alive in our hearts, so that, that when we do meet him, we can uh, really be joyful at that time. Jehovah, we thank you that we are able to uh, meet together to, to uh, in comfort and encourage each other today. We pray that we're able to do so in a way that is beneficial for all. We thank you, Father, for your love, your guidance, your protection. We pray that we can uh, continue to be uh, guided for you. So we thank you, Jehovah, for everything you've done for us, and especially for the, what you're doing for us in this time of need. And we offer you this prayer, in the name of your Son, and our King, Christ Jesus.